Victor Morning. 30 minute uh, Victor Morning Report. I'm happy to be here and discuss with Ravi. We have our great team and I'm excited. So if anyone has a case to present today, please let us know. And Ravi, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. Uh, I was recently a little bit under the weather, but today is the first day that I'm feeling better. So it's really nice to be able to hang out with you all. Um, you, uh, you know, our team is is incredible and hard at work doing many things. And um, two of our team members, Omaima and Yasmin, have been working hard on something very particular. So Yasmin, do you want to tell folks what you've been up to? Of course. Hello, everyone. Uh, Maima and I have been working on a survey, on a VMR survey, to see uh, if, if the schedule that we have currently is good for everyone. And if not, we want to know which time slot will be better for everyone so we can have you all here uh, live on the VMRs. So please fill it in. We're going to uh, add the link for everyone that unfortunately cannot join us today down in the video, in the YouTube video. And also we're going to share with, share with you in the, in the chat. So please, it will be very helpful if you fill it out so we can know how to accommodate better. Um, yes, Hans, in a moment, we're going to plug it in. So thank you so much for everybody. And yeah, let's see how it goes. Amazing. There's no one faster than Hans who's like, oh, where is it? <laughs> Thank you, Hans. We love your enthusiasm. Deborah, I think people are intimidated by your brilliance. Nobody has a case. No, oh. please. Please don't be. <laughs> <laughs> Deborah, what have you been up to? Um, my brother just graduated, so we are happy. Uh, he is, will be he'll be doing internal medicine here in Brazil, looking for be a, a cardiologist. So uh -huh. a lot of happy days for us and our family. And this year will be me graduating, so we are excited. <laughs> Your family must be very proud to have two back-to-back -back graduating doctors. That's incredible. Um, uh, how do you feel about him being internal medicine and cardiology like you? Do you like, do you talk about internal medicine or do you argue about it? Or what's the, uh, what's the sibling internal medicine? Model? <laughs> no, I like, I think it's a good, a good choice to internal yeah. medicine. I don't, I, I don't think cardiology is for me, but if he's happy about it, so I'll be happy for him. <laughs> sweet. That's very sweet. I think uh, Deborah is just asking any of you to present a cardiology case today. Please, please, <laughs> please don't. <laughs> Oh, no way. Oh, a VMR legend old timer may have a case. <laughs> vale, what's up? Hi, everyone. Long time to see. I, I do have a case that I really uh, like, but it's very um, messy. So I don't have it together, but I do have the data. So um, yeah. I can present. Amazing. Vale, well, you know that um, when when I present cases on RLR, I make up the data and just fit fit into the diagnosis. So feel free to do the same. Um, we're really excited to have you back today, and even more excited to uh, learn from your case. Cool, thank you, Vale. Um, all right, I'm ready to rock and roll. Okay, so I will start with the chief concern that is um, visual hallucinations. And this is the case of a 58 year old male that presents with uh, two weeks of episodes um, of visual hallucinations, of complex visual hallucinations characterized by um, faces that appear in his uh, visual field that are um, expanding and they're quite angry and they're trying to chase him. And at first they are scary, but then he realizes that they are not real. And also um, these episodes last about two to five minutes and are preceded by an, uh, uh, a right uh, parietal and occipital headache that is uh, of moderate intensity and is type like a, a pressure like uh, characteristics and then the episodes occur and then he also refers that for the last year or so he's been having um, blurry vision 
but it is not accentuated by the episodes. You asked for no cardiology, but you got the deep depths of neurology, my friend. <laughs> what are you thinking? So um, visual hallucinations, I think I never heard of this chief complaint, so it's good to work a little bit the brain. Um, I start me thinking like, what would be a visual hallucination? No? The person seeing something that is not actually there, that would be hallucination. So I would first think like how the person is realizing that, how is that happening? And when, how long time is happening? And how if how was before? How was the person before that? If have any problem um, related like that or like any disease and everything? I would think it could be something psychiatric um, or something neurologic, but not just that. I would think about alcohol, uh, illegal drugs. Is the patient about to sleep? Uh, if it's a delirium um, and the things on the brain, epilepsy, a tumor, uh, a stress could be too. Or and then the the thinking about the psychiatric, like bipolar, a borderline, uh, a depression. So yeah, I think the first step would be investigated more and to try to find the, why the patient is having this visual hallucination. What do you think, Ravi? Yeah, Deborah, I think that's absolutely superb. It's really admirable to see how much, even though you haven't seen this complaint before, to really try to understand how is it that you made so much progress? So can you enlighten us? You've never thought of this or seen of this before. How did you think of the things you thought about? From where? Or how did you put it together? I think from... All the knowledge from medicine, maybe some stuff that we see during the career. So make me think, for example, the drugs and I don't know, the stress and then the psychiatric that I study. I think it's some years of studying, maybe. <laughs> you know, I really I really want to hold this moment because I think it's so powerful. Um, and the reason it's so powerful is I remember the first time we talked and how you were citing how you felt like you didn't know enough to participate and that you wanted to just have your video off and just like hang back because you didn't feel like you knew enough. But here we are um, a year and a half later with you essentially saying, I've never seen this before. And yet, and yet you're able to say so much. And I think that's so powerful for people to know because um, in many times in medicine, when you see something for the first time, you'll never have thought about it before. But you can make so much inferences and make so much educated guesses based on what you already know. And the only thing that stops you is your own confidence, really. And that, that um, confidence is complicated and rooted in many things. But I think you just saw someone who said, I've never thought of this or done this before, but who has worked so hard over many years to, um, to elevate your confidence and sense of self to be able to just share all that. It was absolutely beautiful, really. Um, I'm gonna try to, to, um, to, try to um, show you that there are two or three key questions with visual hallucinations that you can localize it more. And I bet you're gonna know the answers even though you've never thought about this before. So I'll just tell you that when somebody has a visual hallucination, just like any visual problem, it can be an eye issue or a brain issue. So the first step is to try to say, is it an eye issue or a brain issue? And you can make a lot of progress based on studying the nature of the hallucination. So Deborah, what do you think is more likely to be eye and which one do you think is more likely brain? And I'll give you two examples. One is a patient who sees lines, just lines, or two, a patient who sees a fully formed face. Which one do you think is more eye and which one do you think is more brain? A face um, or lines? What do you think? I think the line, I think the lines could be from the eye and the face could be from the brain. Exactly right. The eye is not smart enough to form complex objects. It requires the brain. So 
when patients um, have a visual hallucination, that is that they see a floater or a flashing light or a zap, it's much more likely that the diseases that they're dealing with are simple ocular issues like retinal detachment or retinitis or really anything with the, the, the uh, retina and the optic nerve. The more complicated the visual hallucination, i.e. it has color, it has motion, it has definition, the more likely it is to be in the brain. When you are in the brain, the next key question is to ask what else is involved because visual symptoms can be part of a complicated neurological issue. However, and if that's the case, the DDX is very broad. The DDX is occipital and optic fibers and part of a complex neurological disease. However, if you are lucky enough that the patient is describing isolated visual hallucinations without encephalopathy, without substance withdrawal, without any other symptoms, it's much more likely that you're dealing with an isolated occipital disease as opposed to a multifactorial neuropsychiatric issue. So from the very get-go, alcohol withdrawal, substance withdrawal, psych psychiatric diseases are much less likely when there is nothing else going on except visual hallucinations. So now you know for sure that this patient has some issue with the occipital lobe. And so now the question for us, Deborah, is what does it mean? How does it help us that the patient has been having blurry vision? He's having these hallucinations, but he has background blurry vision. What do you think about that? The blurry vision, I think, make me think that could be the nerve, the the what what the patient is why his patient is seeing that exactly That's right what... exactly right blurry vision is not usually a neurological issue blurry vision means there's something in, in interfering with the uh, light coming and hitting the retina and the optic nerve something blocking it there are only two neurological causes for blurry vision one is the optic nerve is edematous so papal edema and two, pupillary dysfunction. So when you have autonomic pupillary dysfunction, the two Ps. So blurry vision is usually an eye issue. Um, and the two exceptions are the two Ps, pupillary dysfunction or papilledema. So Deborah, here's the problem now. Valley has given us so much incredibly helpful information. The blurry vision is an eye issue, probably. And the hallucinations are likely a occipital lobe issue. How can we connect them? Any thoughts? It's tricky, right? Good. Yeah, good question. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, that's pro tip. If you don't know the answer to the question, just say it's a good question and sit there and say nothing until the other person responds. So I think that this, this, this goes to show you that the schema that we discussed is actually a little bit flawed. Because chronic eye issues can result in loss of innervation of the occipital lobe, creating the occipital lobe to go crazy. The occipital lobe needs input from the eye to stay calm. And if the occipital lobe over a long period of time is deprived of stimulation from the eye, it starts to make things up. And that thing is called Charles Bonnet syndrome. It's highly underrecognized, but there are some other really important causes of visual isolated visual hallucinations. And those are occipital lobe seizures, occipital migraine, and a very rare but important thing for us to know, which is HHS or hyperglycemic uh, occipital lobe seizures. Very, very important. So I think the key question in this patient now is the schema eye or brain, and is it brain isolated visual or visual plus something else? And we already have some guesses, but we need a lot more information to be confident that we're dealing with an isolated visual issue. Any questions or thoughts before we ask Vali to tell us more? Okay, all right, Vali, you set us up for a really nice conversation. Yeah, I'm so happy. This is amazing. Um, I love neurology. I don't know why anyone would want to um, 
I don't know. Neurology is so interesting, but anyways, I forgot to mention. I don't want to do cardiology. Honestly, neither do I. I have no, I have no, under, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We love your brother, Deborah. We love him. <laughs> I forgot to mention on the HPI that um, the hallucinations predominated or were more in the left visual field. Um, so the patient kind of chased them to that side. Uh, they persisted in the night uh, and uh, happened approximately five times per hour the last two weeks. So in past medical history, the patient uh, was diagnosed with diabetes two years ago um, with very uh, irregular treatment. And also in 2015 had the history of a cerebral aneurysm, but he couldn't elaborate on that. Also has hypertension um, since 2020. And then, um, well, no family history. On medications, well, he takes uh, insulin and pH um, twice a day, but it's very regular on that. And also losartan and amlodipine and hydrochlorothiazide. On the social history, he uh, has a heavy alcohol consumption history up to Wait, let me pull it here. Uh, four times a week. And then um, health-related behaviors. Um, he had one partner, one sexual partner with um, inconsistent use of uh, condoms, no allergies. And then I think we can, do you want me to stop here or would you prefer I give the exam? Why don't you give us the exam just for the sake of time since we're uh, Okay, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, he's a febrile, a uh, pressure of 130 over 60, a heart rate of 60, um, a respiratory rate of 20. And he, uh, well, everything on the other uh, regional exams are, are fine. I'm going to go straight to the neuro exam, which is the interesting part. So he was oriented and alert. Um, his uh, superior cerebral functions or cognitive functions were fine. Um, cranial nerves were also fine. Um, there was, uh, here. Uh, so uh, the only thing on the first exam that we did was that he had an unstable gait. And he said that it was because of the blurry vision. However, when he had the episodes, he had a left deviation of the case with some horizontal nystagmus. Um, and he also had on the posterior exam, well, let me pull it here. I believe it is left homonymous amyanopsia. Let me just confirm that for you. Yes. Otherwise, everything was normal. Wow, very, very intriguing. Uh, Deborah, what do you think? Um, so going for the past medical history, the patient has diabetes. That could, could cause the retinal, uh, the retinal passing of diabetes, but it doesn't, it would be more glaucoma or something like that. I don't think it would be what this patient is presenting now. And the patient drink alcohol, that that could like be one of the cause of the visual hallucination, uh, like alcohol use disorder, like the patient can have, that can, can make him have that. And going for the newer exam, the patient had unstable gait to left deviation of the patient. Yeah, so like the left homonymous and manopsia make us sure that he has a problem in the optic nerve, nerve, but the rest make me think that could be something in his brain. So I don't really know. What do you think, Bradley? I think the interpretation of the neuro exam is going to be key, right? That's the most important thing. And after that, we can layer in the findings that um, the, the past medical history. So when when we say left homonymous hemianopsia, we mean that in both eyes, 
the left side is deficient. Right eye and left eye, you cannot see towards the left. What does that make you think of? So patient with their right eye, they don't see anything to the left. And with their left eye, they don't see anything to the left. What do you think of that? Um, I have to remember the draw that we do of the, yeah. and I don't really remember now, but like, I don't know, maybe if he's, I, I, I don't know how yeah, to explain. Like doing a little do you know the draw that I'm saying of the, the uh, optical nerve? A hundred percent. I'll keep it simple. If both eyes are involved, if both eyes are involved, it must be behind the optic chiasm. Both eyes are involved. So you know this is either, uh, this is a, a pre-chiasmatic or occipital uh, lobe. Um, and so I think the fact that this deficiency is accompanied by uh, what now has to be concerning for occipital lobe seizures, I think you're probably dealing with something in the right occipital lobe. The way you can distinguish uh, ox the occipital lobe from deeper visual structures is whether or not central vision is spared. In patients with um, occipital lobe uh, uh, issues, the central vision is usually spared, but in patients with deeper structures, that is usually uh, uh, involved as well. So here, you know for sure the patient has right um, has a right occipital lobe issue. What do you think of his gait? What I'm thinking about his gait. He has unstable gait and he has left deviation. Mm. Maybe and it could be I, maybe it could be related with the vision problem and uh, as he has nystagmus to something the cerebellum, maybe uh, 100%. could be related. Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that he's following towards his left um, and has uh, horizontal nystagmus is worrisome for the fact that the cerebellum is involved. So I think now Valley's exam is superb because it tells us for sure that we have an occipital lobe problem. It also suggests the possibility that he has something in his cerebellum. And so now we're dealing with a multifocal neurological issue. The unifying denominator may be that he has had strokes, posterior circulation strokes, as a result of his diabetes and his cerebral aneurysm and his hypertension. So I think now this is an occipital lobe issue and a cerebellar issue. And whenever you have issues like that, you should have to, you have to prioritize three things. Is there ischemia? Is there inflammation like infection? Or um, is there compression? Is there a mass lesion uh, in the posterior fossa? So I think those will be the most important. But the things we have to track are that he has at risk for atherosclerosis, that he is at risk of consequences of alcohol use disorder, and he's at risk of sexually transmitted infections, including HIV. Um, so we'll have to keep track of all of those. All right, Vali, why don't you tell us more? Yes, I just wanted to make uh, clear. I mean, I, I don't think it's that, um, it doesn't change a lot of the, of the discussion that you're making brilliant points, but I was still saying left case deviation, no left case. Um, he only had like an unstable gait uh, with no deviation. Uh, okay, so some initial labs, uh, WBC hemoglobin and platelets were normal, but was abnormal where his, uh, his glucose actually, he came with uh, 496 of glucose and then the monitoring of his glucose were very, very uh, worrisome. He, he jumped, especially, on the mornings or on the and in the late evenings, up to 300, 400. Um, so he was very irregular. And also, uh, he had a glycosylated hemoglobin of 20, which we couldn't repeat <laughs> because we don't have it in the hospital. But anyways, we we knew that his diabetes was not uh, um, right. So um, his EKG was normal. His check x ray was also normal. We did an, EE, uh, an electroencephalogram, which showed, uh, let me pull it here, one second. 
oh, I can give you, wait, what is this? Okay, so we did a CT on admission to roll out what you mentioned, the possibility of a stroke. And there was a, a small hypodensity next to the posterior, um, I don't know what to call it, like the posterior part of the lateral ventricle on the left side, suggested of an old infarct, like, you know, some retraction that can have some old strokes. And the rest of the CT was normal. We couldn't access an MRI right away, but I can give you the EEG just so that, okay, so it's showed um, attenuation of the rhythm in the posterior level of the right hemisphere. No epileptiform activity. Oh, Deborah, what do you think? Fascinating. So I was thinking about the glucose that it's elevated and maybe that could be influence in, his, in the patient like that. Um, I would investigate if the patient normally take care of his diabetes or no. And the imaging, I, I will let for you to interpret oh. it. Oh, thank you. You're so kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think the imaging is, is confusing because uh, there are many things that can cause hypodensity, but and I'm not sure what uh, the location I'm having a hard time interpreting. But at the end of the day, um, this patient is probably suffering a neurological complication of diabetes, especially given how high the A1C is. So the question is, what are the CNS complications of diabetes? And the most important one is hypoglycemia by far and away. However, there are two other really important ones. One is the increased risk of stroke in patients with diabetes. And two, the unique complications of HHS. Patients with ketosis do not get this complication that I'm going to talk about. And that is a much lower seizure threshold and a much lower uh, um, uh, central nervous system hyperexcitability. And that the most famous form is called diabetic striatopathy, where patients have usually unilateral abrupt myoclonic or choreiform movements called diabetic striatopathy. However, patients with hyperglycemia without ketosis, no ketosis, can also have a wide range of uh, central nervous system neuroexcitability, including occipital lobe seizures. How do I know this? I saw a patient with it very eye-opening. So I think you, we have to be careful and make, and make sure that the patient doesn't have an underlying lesion that's making them even more susceptible to the consequences of hyperglycemia without ketosis. And that the concern for that underlying structural lesion is twofold. One, he has a persistent deficit, not an intermittent one. And two, he has and uh, neuroradiological imaging of a persistent issue. So I think my worst case scenario is there is both a stroke and the consequences of hyperglycemia. That's the worst case scenario. Good news is that he doesn't have evidence of HIV on his labs. Usually there's leukopenia or anemia or something like that. Although syphilis could certainly escape our attention. But my next steps would be if all I have all the resources in the world, I would get an MRI, but I would work really hard on controlling his sugar and watching things, these things go away. You may ask, well, wait, he's not having any seizures on the EEG. Does that mean he's not having seizures at all? You can answer that question by maybe going into a more familiar territory of, can a patient have arrhythmia with a normal EKG? And the answer is yes to both because both an EEG and an EKG are temporary. So um, yeah, I would most worry about the patient having diabetic striatopathy with possible extension into the occipital lobe but I pre make sure that he's not having, he, hasn't, he doesn't have an underlying stroke that's lowering his threshold to do so. Any other thoughts, um, Deborah, before we learn from Bali? Okay. No. <laughs> okay, tell us more, please. Oh, that, that, this is amazing. Um, so yeah, we actually started him before the EEG uh, on caramazepine still just because of the suspicion. And we increased the doses of insulin. We saw that when he controlled his glucose, the episodes decreased. So that kind of uh, made us think, okay, maybe the glucose can be, if not the cause, a precipitant of an epileptic focus or something like that. 
but we still were a little shocked because the CT didn't show any acute um, changes. And if the stroke was like two weeks ago when the symptoms started, we were expecting something. Um, so what we did at this point was an MRI um, and the MRI, so I'm gonna reveal the final diagnosis. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. So the MRI shockingly showed uh, hyperintensity with diffusion restriction on the uh, right occipital lobe, which was compatible with an acute, at this point, uh, maybe a little sort of acute uh, stroke that could be causing the, um, the epilep epileptic um, episodes and also that were characterized by visual hallucinations. And so we started him on aspirin and estatins, and he went home uh, with a significant decrease, but also uh, not a decrease of the of the blurry vision, which we consulted ophthalmology on, and they said that it could be because of uh, diabetic retinopathy. And I just wanted to highlight that the chat was brilliant on pointing out the possibility early on of Charles Bonnet syndrome, and also the possibility of migraines, because I think in this patient it was really challenging to differentiate if the um, the, the headache that he had was the migraine or if it was like an aura or like a, a preceding factor of the seizure itself. And I just wanted to recommend because actually I was reading this when this came, this case came to me. So it was perfect. Uh, I was reading Hallucinations by Oliver Sacks and it has like the first chapter is on Charles Bonnet syndrome. So it was perfect. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for this discussion. It was brilliant. Deborah, what do you think? Oh, thank you, Vale, for the case. It was really good. I learned a lot. Now, what I think, like, I would tell something about me. I have a notebook because I love writing stuff from CPS Solver. So I have something, and this morning I was reading because I knew it that I would discuss with Riley. So I have something new to add, like some visual hallucination and a little bit more of diabetes retinopathy. So thank you, Vale, so much for for teaching us with this case is always so good to learn with you all. You know, I, I, for those of you who have joined very recently, I'm not sure if you, you may have not have seen Valley present. Uh, maybe you saw her on Neuro VMR presenting, but I think that, you know, uh, just so you know, context, Vale was l the life of, uh, and still is in many ways, but was a prominent presence on VMR for a long, long, long time. And you can see that uh, her presentation skills and story selling skills are so incredibly well honed. Um, this was such a well-told story and he really allowed us to have a deep conversation. And I think at the end of the day, um, it's really tricky to make these diagnoses because you can make an argument that the patient had a stroke for sure, had a hyperglycemia maybe worsening and, and maybe had Charles Bonnet, all three of them. But I think the most important diagnosis to discover was the stroke, right? Like you, you'll fix the glucose, um, the vision issues, you probably can't do much about the stroke is really important. So the question in all this is, what is your most important clue that there is a stroke? And that was that the patient had a fixed deficit. This case was all about excess, excess, and hyperactivity. And hyperactivity, seizure, HHS, and Charles Bonnet makes sense. But a deficit, a focal deficit is very, very concerning. So if you remove the left homonymous hemianopsia from this case, it probably is Charles Bonnet and a little bit of HHS, but the deficit is really key here. So kudos to you for recognizing that for and for presenting it. Really, really is uh, very telling. Vali, what did you learn from uh, from being involved earlier on in this case? Uh, this was an amazing case for me um, because I mean, I, I I don't know. It's it's just so interesting. I haven't heard I hadn't heard about Charles Bonnet syndrome up until this point, and I think it's a very great point that you know a lot of patients in neurology consult are going to show up with chronic vision loss, like because of retinal problems or like eye problems, and then they're gonna have these complex and often they are not aware that they are not real uh, hallucinations, even though that most of the time they do recognize that they are not real. And so I think it's a great point because I have never heard of this and it's apparently very common and you can um, kind of not give the best care to patients when you assume that um, visual hallucinations may, may think that they are, I don't know, crazy or something. So I think that's my biggest takeaway. I love it. I think that's so, so wise. Um, maybe I'll present a story that um, someday that actually is a long, very sad and un unfortunate saga of a patient with visual hallucinations and it didn't need to be. And it really latches on a point you're making right now. 
Deborah, how did it feel for you? Feels good. Feels good. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. I'm really glad, happy to participate. <laughs> so concise and so spot on. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll pass the mic to David to take us home with the uh, with the learning point. So great case uh, that started with a uh, 68 year old man uh, complaining with uh, visual hallucinations. Visual hallucinations have uh, a long DDX, but uh, Ravi taught us to uh, try to differentiate between eye issues and brain issues. Uh, the DDX uh, comprehends uh, neurophthalmic diseases like Sazonet syndrome and, and recognized um, uh, cause of, of visual hallucinations, uh, very common in, in uh, older patients. Um, also, psychiatric diseases uh, such as uh, schizophrenia or bipolar uh, disease. Uh, also, neurodegenerative, uh, a lot of dementia, specific, specifically, uh, the uh, dementia is, is also a, a common uh, cause of uh, visual hallucinations. Um, neurological diseases such as occipital uh, migraine, occipital seizures. Uh, or other uh, damage to the occipital cor cortex or the, or the optic uh, pathway uh, can also cause uh, these hallucinations. And there are also these uh, kind of physiological hallucinations related to to the um, to the um, the time of um, of uh, how you say that um, of sleeping in a topic or in a topic. Uh, hallucinations and um, also drugs such as alcohol, opiates. Uh, they now remind us in, in the chat that using could also uh, cause these hallucinations and also uh, toxic me metabolic encephalopathy such as HHAS, uh, that is a, is a very difficult, uh, I think, uh, problem to, to think uh, of a cause uh, such as. A, a, a cause of, of this uh, visual illumination. And how to make progress uh, based on, on symptoms? Well, visual, uh, simple visual hallucinations uh, should uh, make us think more of uh, an eye issue, uh, while complex um, visual hallucinations um, make, uh, should make, of, make us think of brain issues. Um, and other, if there are other associated symptoms, uh, we can we can think also of more extra brain diseases. Um, uh, in in this case, uh, other symptoms like uh, that we discover later, like blurry vision um, and uh, ammonius nausea or uh, the gait uh, abnormality, um, make make us make us uh, think of. Uh, that, that the damage could be in the in the occipital uh, lobe, uh, also uh, maybe in the in the cerebral uh, area. No, and the homonymous enalgia uh, makes uh, think of uh, a lesion after the chiasm. And when you have uh, various uh, areas damage in the in the brain, like. In this case, uh, appear to be, and we could think ma mainly of three three causes, three group of causes: uh, ischemia, inflammation, and, and compression uh, by any mass. Um, in this case, the, the most important clue to, to the final DX that was disturbed is was that uh, the, there was a fixed deficit um, that. Um, couldn't be explained by by other causes such as uh, only hypoglycemia or or other complications of, of the diabetes that uh, could uh, explain similar features that uh, that doesn't uh, doesn't make a, a fixed deficit. No, um, this uh, pair that uh, Ravi stated about uh, CNS complications of mm, diabetes, uh, thinking of uh, also about um, the HHS uh, complications, such as diabetes, uh, such as uh, I think very uh, very difficult to to have in mind. But uh, well, I, I think you need to do it out. <laughs> uh, 
um, and that's all. Uh, I well, just to to remind that uh, you have uh, in the chat in the and we we will uh, share later the um, link to 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 fill the 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 request about uh, the the EMR schedule that you that you prefer the study. So uh, well, uh, we we will uh, link uh, pass the link later also, and well, just me is is uh, unit uh, to the chat. So Philip, please, and see. Thank you, David. It's so true, Vale. We 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 neuro VMRs are always a little bit longer. There's so much more to dissect. Thank you, David. I think Deborah, he makes us sound so much smarter than we actually look. Look how organized this is. It's unbelievable. Thank you, David. And thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. We we'll hope to see you tomorrow, tomorrow for uh, RLR. I know.